Hey there, hockey fans. Nick Hart here, and I have returned for another edition of our new video series, Six Degrees of Tom Kostopoulos. If you didn't see our first video, the pilot episode, if you will, of Six Degrees of Tom Kostopoulos, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, a, because it was a fun little history lesson dating all the way back to the 1940s, and B, because that first video gives a little bit more of an in-depth explainer of what we're doing in these videos. But basically, the idea is that we can connect any NHLer in history to Tom Kostopoulos by jumping from teammate to teammate until that thread leads us back to the beloved longtime captain of the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Before we start our round two today, I'll give a quick refresher of the rules that we laid out for this exercise. Once again, this is a, uh, uh, there's a more in-depth explainer back in our first video, but quick refresher, quick refresher. <clears throat> the players that we start with can be any NHLer from any team starting from 1942, the start of what's typically referred to as the original six era. We will then try and connect the dots from our starting person to Tom Kostopoulos, and each teammate we look at along the way will count as one step, one degree of separation. We want to connect that first person to Tom Kostopoulos in as few degrees of separation as possible. Each time we'll start with someone who played in the NHL, but from then on out we can use any league to try and reach TK, college hockey, junior hockey, AHL, ECHL. We've even used the defunct WHA, so you get the picture. However, the kicker is that throughout this series, we can never use the same player twice. So for example, because Kelly Buckberger made an appearance in our debut video, we cannot use Buckberger again to try and connect someone to Tom Kostopoulos. We'll have to navigate down a different path because the Buckberger road is closed from here on out. Last time, we were just getting a feel for things, so we just picked a player to start with and jumped right in. But... Who will serve as our starting block for today's race? Let's find out. <laughs> All right. Today we're starting with Gilbert Perrault. Gilbert Perrault had a 17-year Hall of Fame career, all spent as a member of the Buffalo Sabres. In fact, Perrault was the inaugural Sabre, but the story of how he ended up in Buffalo is one for the ages. You see, while Perrault was running roughshod over junior hockey in the late 60s, the NHL was planning expansion. Two new teams were due to join the league, starting with the 1970-71 season, and those two teams were the Buffalo Sabres and Vancouver Canucks. And when the NHL was planning the 1970 amateur draft, it was deemed that the two new teams would pick at the top. But which team would get to pick first? Today, we're all familiar with the modern draft lottery process, but with two teams coming in with no track record, the NHL decided that the best way to determine the first overall pick was not a lottery, but a wheel. The NHL brought a big crown and anchor prize wheel. Think Wheel of Fortune, but standing on its side. They brought this wheel to the draft and put numbers in each slot on the wheel. The NHL then said, all right, guys, if the wheel lands on an even number, Vancouver gets the first pick. If it's an odd number, it's Buffalo's pick. The other expansion team will then pick second. And there wasn't time to debate. There was no negotiation. This is how it was going to be done. So the then league president, Clarence Campbell, gave the wheel a spin. And the Canucks, the Sabres, and every other team at the draft watched with bated breath to see who would end up with the first pick. Who would get to start their franchise with a talent like Gilbert Perrault? It was high theater. High theater, folks. And as the wheel slowed and then came to a stop, Campbell glanced at the result and made an announcement along the lines of, the wheel has landed on number 12. That's an even number. The Vancouver Canucks will select first overall. 
And the Canucks leapt up at their draft table, started shaking hands and celebrating. We're going to get Perot. We're drafting Perot. They were probably thinking. But Buffalo's draft table was located right in the front row where the wheel was spun. And the Sabres calmly asked for Campbell to take a second look at the marker on the wheel. And Campbell looked back and, yup, it landed on number 11. Not 12. 11. A Steve Harvey moment for the league's president, and he had to let everyone know that the wheel had actually landed on an odd number, and thus Buffalo would get first overall. And yeah, they drafted Gilbert Perrault. Perrault made an instant impact with his new team, electrifying fans from the get-go in his new city and winning the Calder Trophy as the league's Rookie of the Year. The Sabres quickly surrounded him with other talent, including drafting his former junior teammate, Rick Martin, and swinging a trade for Rene Robert. Those three became known as the French Connection Line, one of the most famous and iconic forward trios in league history. Those three regularly found themselves in the All-Star Game. Martin had a handful of 40-goal seasons and actually reached 50 twice. Robert similarly had big offensive numbers, including the first 100-point season in Buffalo franchise history. But make no mistake, the straw that stirred the drink on that line was Perrault at center with his dazzling puck skills and unparalleled playmaking ability. The French connection line led the Sabres to the Stanley Cup final in what was only Buffalo's fifth season in the league, but they fell short against the Philadelphia Flyers, the first expansion team of any kind to win the Cup. The Sabres never got that close to winning the Stanley Cup again during Perrault's tenure, something that still eludes Buffalo to this day, but his legacy isn't measured by championships lost. Perrault is remembered for being one of the very best players of his era and his role in fostering a rabid, passionate fan base from scratch. He finished his career with 1,326 points in 1,191 games played. He retired in 1987 and became a first ballot Hall of Famer upon his induction in 1990. The Sabres have also hung his number 11 from the rafters, a uniform no one in Sabres history has ever used aside from Perot, who, by the way, donned 11 on his sweater as an homage to the digits that brought him to Buffalo thanks to that lucky wheel in 1970. So to go from Gilles Perot to Tom Kostopoulos, we have to use a saber, as the Hall of Famer played his entire career with that club. But we're not going to utilize another member of the French Connection line. Instead, we'll turn our attention to a defenseman by the name of Uwe Krupp. Uwe Krupp started his NHL career as a rookie on the Buffalo Sabres when Perot was having his swan song in 1986-87, and he went on to be one of the most decorated Germans in league history. Back in the 80s, German-born players were a rarity, but as a defenseman who stood at 6'6 six six and 230 pounds, the Sabres were willing to give him a shot. Krupp started that 86-87 season with Perot and the Sabres, but finished it in the American Hockey League, where he played a key role in the Rochester Americans winning the Calder Cup. The next year, he was firmly in the NHL, proving his toughness by taking on all comers who wanted to tilt with the towering German, racking up 151 penalty minutes in the process. But Krupp's game wasn't all about tough guy shenanigans. Despite his massive dimensions, he possessed a sneaky mobility and was very adept at moving the puck. He maxed out his offensive production with 12 goals and 32 assists for 44 points from the blue line in 1990-91. However, People outside of Buffalo don't often think of Krupp as a saver. Most hockey fans remember Uwe Krupp as a Stanley Cup winner with the Colorado Avalanche. See, Colorado had an absolute wagon in its first season as a franchise after relocating from Quebec. They racked up 47 wins to finish first in the Pacific Division and second overall in the Western Conference. The Avs also battled their way to the 1996 Stanley Cup Final in their inaugural season, and that's where Krupp left his mark on hockey history. Colorado entered Game 4 of the 1996 Stanley Cup Final with a 3-0 series lead over the Florida Panthers and a chance to sweep their way to the Cup. The Panthers refused to make it easy on the loaded avalanche, keeping them off the scoreboard for the 60 minutes of regulation. Thing is, Florida failed to score in that time too. So on they went to overtime, tied 0-0, and then another overtime. 
and then a third overtime, and that's when Uwe Krupp said enough and became perhaps the unlikeliest of Stanley Cup heroes by scoring the cup-clinching goal at 431 of 3 OT. The goal not only granted the Avalanche their first Stanley Cup in their first year in the league, but it also was the city of Denver's first major sports championship of any kind, and Krupp became the first German player to ever win the Stanley Cup. He continued to play for a handful of years in the NHL after his heroics in the Cup Final before returning to Germany to be a coach. He is currently behind the bench as the head coach of his hometown, Kultner Haie, and a Calder Cup champion, a Stanley Cup champion, and eventually an IAHF Hall of Famer. Krupp retired with 729 NHL games to his name, played as a Sabre, a member of the Avalanche, Quebec Nordiques, New York Islanders, Detroit Red Wings, and the Atlanta Thrashers. There are a bevy of impressive names on that Avalanche squad that won the Cup in 96, and one of them, as it turns out, is our link to Tom Kostopoulos. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Stefan Yell. Yell was far from an offensive dynamo during his time in the NHL. In fact, he scored fewer points in his career than the defenseman we last talked about, Uwe Krupp. Still, Yell managed to play a 14-year career in the NHL thanks to his relentless playing style and proficiency at face-offs and penalty killing. In fact, from the time Yell entered the league in 1995 to the day he retired in 2010, only four players took more draws while shorthanded than Stefan Yell. Those attributes made him an attractive player throughout his career, and it should be mentioned that his teams failed to make the playoffs only once during his 14 years in the NHL. Of course, Yell tasted instant success upon joining the NHL as part of Colorado's cup-winning team in 1996, and then he did it again when the Avs went seven games deep in the final against the New Jersey Devils in 2001. After that, Yell parted with Colorado following seven years with the club, but he continued to be a trustworthy hand in the bottom six while suiting up for the Calgary Flames, Boston Bruins, and the Carolina Hurricanes before being dealt back to the Avalanche where he finished his career. He fell just nine games shy of 1,000 games in his NHL career, but stepping on the ice for 171 playoff games plus two parades with the Stanley Cup likely makes up for coming a hair short on the 1,000-game milestone. And when it comes to his relation to Tom Kostopoulos, it was right at the end of Yo's career when he was a teammate to TK, 2009-10, the only year in which Kostopoulos dressed for all 82 games in an NHL season, he and Yell were teammates on the Hurricanes before that aforementioned trade back to Colorado. Only three degrees of separation to get from Buffalo's Wheel of Fortune prize, Gilbert Perrault, to the great Tom Kostopoulos. This was our order of operations, as we started with the Hall of Famer and French Connection catalyst Perrault, who briefly served as a mentor and teammate to a young Uwe Krupp, who made history while winning the Stanley Cup with the sturdy Stefaniel, who played with Tom Kostopoulos in Carolina. You know what? That went so much quicker than our first video that we should try again. Let's start with a new player and see how many degrees of separation they are from Tom Kostopoulos. Who we got? Okay, okay. Let's start our second round of the day with goaltender Karitako. Hailing from Uusikaupunki, Finland, Takko became a star in his homeland before arriving in the NHL. In the first few seasons of his pro career, he became a fan favorite for Porin Asad fans by taking the club to the SM Liga final in 1984 and then winning the league's best goalie award the following season. He also manned the crease as Finland's starting goalie at the 1984 Winter Olympics. And after those back-to-back -back stellar seasons, Taco decided to cross the pond and try his hand at being an NHL star, too. Originally drafted by the Quebec Nordiques, Taco's rights were owned by the Minnesota North Stars once they selected him in the 1984 NHL draft after Quebec failed to sign the Finnish netminder. In his first two seasons in Minnesota, Taco essentially split time in goal with veteran Don Beaupre in a 1A, 1B type situation until the emergence of John Casey firmly pushed Taco into a backup role in 1988-89. Taco continued to play for the North Stars, putting up 
unremarkable but not terrible stats all the while until he was traded, the trade that most people in North America remember him for. On November 22, 1990, the defending Stanley Cup champion Edmonton Oilers swung a deal with Minnesota for Karitako in exchange for defenseman Bruce Bell and future considerations. On the surface, this is a pretty dry, nothing burger of a trade. Taco only played 11 games for the Oilers, none of which were in the playoffs, and Bell never took the ice for the North Stars. However, the trade itself is still remembered fondly by hockey enthusiasts of the era because of their surnames. It's always referred to gleefully as the Taco Bell trade. Yep, Taco Bell. As I said before, the focus of our Finnish fixation didn't last long in Edmonton, and he left the NHL after the conclusion of the 91 playoffs. But he didn't call it quits completely. No, no. After 142 NHL games, Tucko decided to live Moss back in his homeland, and he immediately reassumed the mantle of one of the country's very best between the pipes. He returned to Asat, where he once again won the SM Liga's top goaltender award in 1994, and after three more seasons with the Aces and an additional three years in the Swedish Elite League, Tucko hung up his pads in the year 2000. He was named to the Finnish Hockey Hall of Fame in 2006, and he spent a majority of his post-playing career as a scout for the Dallas Stars. In fact, he is currently the team's director of European scouting, and he has had a hand in significant European draft picks for the reigning Western Conference champs, including guys like John Klingberg and Miro Heiskanen. To position Kari Tako as closely to Tom Kostopoulos as possible, we'll turn to that cup of coffee that he had with the Oilers. Now, I see that Francois LaRue played one game for Edmonton that season, and of course, LaRue and Kostopoulos were teammates in Wilkesbury Scranton, but Taco didn't play in that one game LaRue dressed for, and the game sheets provided by NHL.com during that time period, they don't denote who the backup goalies are. So, uh, we can't say for certain if LaRue qualifies for what we're doing here on Six Degrees of Tom Kostopoulos. And... We can't go with Kelly Buckberger either because we already used him in our first video. But fear not! Instead, let's go from one fun name in hockey history to another all-timer, Jeff Bukaboom. Jeff Bukaboom was a massive stay-at-home defenseman who did more than just ride shotgun for numerous cup-winning teams. A bruiser at every level he played at, no one liked to mix it up with the hulking 6'5 defender. Adept at winning puck battles and clearing the net front, Bukaboom won the Stanley Cup in Edmonton in 1990. And during the 1991-92 season, the big blue liner was traded by the Oilers to the New York Rangers, the move coming mere weeks after the Oils sent Marc Messier to Madison Square Garden. It was in New York that Bukaboom's career really blossomed. He was still the same rough-and-tumble net protector that he was in Edmonton, but he proved to be the perfect foil to the freewheeling offensive proclivities of the Rangers all-star defenseman Brian Leach. Bukaboom and Leach often played together on the Rangers' top defense pair and helped the Rangers end a 54-year championship drought when they lifted the Stanley Cup at MSG in 1994. Bukaboom continued to endear himself to New York sports fans over the next five seasons, but his career was cut short as a result of a series of unfortunate incidents involving concussions during the 1998-99 campaign. Bukaboom was sucker punched by Matt Johnson of the Los Angeles Kings, an ugly scene that knocked the Rangers' towering defenseman out of action. Three months later, an innocent-looking hit caught Bukaboom just right and re-aggravated his concussion symptoms from earlier in the season. He never played another game in the NHL after that, and the sudden end to his career came with 804 games played, 30 goals, 159 points, and 1,890 penalty minutes. In fact, Bukaboom sits in second place among the Rangers' all-time penalty minutes leaders in franchise history, with 1,157 of those PIMs racked up during his time with the Blue Shirts. After retiring, Bukaboom spent over a decade as an assistant coach in the OHL, AHL, and NHL levels. Today, he's an amateur scout for the Rangers and is still spoken of reverently by the New York and Edmonton hockey fans alike. Naturally, Rangers fans harbor a deep appreciation for Bukaboom because he helped end that long stretch of headaches and heartaches for the hardwareless New York Rangers. And our next stop on the way to Tom Kostopoulos is another member of that cup-winning squad in 1994. 
we transfer from the savvy Bukaboom to the youthful Alexei Kovalev. Drafted 15th overall by the Rangers in 1991, Kovalev stayed in his native Russia for one more year and continued to hone what were touted as elite offensive skills. Once he made it to New York as a wide-eyed 19-year-old, he put those skills to work. He scored in his NHL debut, his first of 20 tallies in his rookie year. The next season, he improved to 23 goals and 56 points and added 21 points in 23 playoff games on the way to lifting the cup in 94. Kovalev continued to be a reliable 20-goal scorer and 50-point producer throughout the 90s, with most of that production coming on the power play. You see, Kovalev had a sniper shot in world-class, silky smooth hands. And these skills translated perfectly to the man advantage, where he proceeded to torment opponents for the duration of his NHL career. And it's not as if Kovalev was some sort of secret either. Three times he played in the NHL All-Star game. He was always a top two-line player for the better part of his career. Teams were simply left powerless to defend his surgical work whenever the AK-27 stepped over the boards for a power play. Kovalev's best seasons came as a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins. The dynamic Russians set career highs during the 2000-2001 season with a whopping 44 goals, 51 assists, and 95 points. And then, with Mario Lemieux sidelined for most of the year with injuries and Yaramir Yager unceremoniously traded to the Washington Capitals, Kovalev stepped up and led Pittsburgh in every offensive category the next season as well. He was putting up big offensive numbers for the Penguins again in 2002-03, but was traded midseason back to the New York Rangers. With 11 seasons under his belt at this point, Kovalev continued to apply his trade in the NHL for another eight seasons before going to Switzerland to end his playing days. The Russian sharpshooter played in over 1,300 NHL games for the Rangers, Penguins, Montreal Canadiens, Ottawa Senators, and Florida Panthers when it was all said and done. He generated 430 goals and 599 assists for 1,029 career points, and over a third of that production came on the power play. I mentioned before that Kovalev's best years came with the Pittsburgh Penguins, so it should come as no surprise that he was there when Tom Kostopoulos made his NHL debut on December 29, 2001, and for several other games before that trade sent Kovey back to the Rangers. Once again, we have only three degrees of separation from where we started to where we ended up, which is always at Tom Kostopoulos. We started with Finnish goalie and funny trade icon Karitako, who shared a locker room for a short time with bruiser Jeff Bukaboom, who ended a five-decade-long Stanley Cup drought for the Rangers with Alexei Kovalev, who played with Tom Kostopoulos as members of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now, remember, as we continue this video series, we cannot use any of these players in our future videos. Kovalev is out. Gilles Perrault, Uwe Krupp, Stefaniel, all out of here. So who are we going to start next time? Who is going to appear next on Six Degrees of Tom Kostopoulos? You'll have to stay posted and keep checking the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins social media for updates, but we'll be back soon enough with another edition of Six Degrees of Tom Kostopoulos, folks. Hope you enjoyed this video today. We had a two-parter. What a surprise. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Stay safe and stay sane, everybody. We'll see you next time.